the lights off in the back. You're, because you're okay. Okay, okay. because it, it was glaring, so. Yeah, give me just a second to come do my part, getting it ready for Facebook Live. <clears throat> Actually, Gil, I think we are live. That's my bad. <laughs> oh my gosh, what did I say? Yeah, way to go. Well, guys, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, obviously, you've been with us for the last 30 seconds, and I didn't appreciate that. But of course, it's another Wednesday night. It is Conversations with Cougars. And you may not recognize his, voice, his face, but you sure are gonna recognize his voice in a minute. And I've got one of the early broadcasters for not only Dothan High in the late 70s, but also Norfew in the 70s and going into the, all the way into the 90s. I wanna welcome longtime radio man in Dothan area, Gil Anthony. Good, good evening, Gil. Bernard, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on. I really, and like I told you before we went on, or maybe we were on, but I really appreciate what you're doing because you're jogging the memory of a whole lot of people and bringing back some some great times that everybody had. And like you said, uh, rekindling old friendships and getting new friendships also. Oh, it's- well, oh, I, yeah. I, I, remember see, I remember seeing your name and seeing you play, but without a uniform and a number, I would you could have passed me in the street and I wouldn't know this is Bernard. <laughs> you know, that's, that's all part of bas uh, basketball. That's all part of football. It's yeah. the one sport where you're completely covered up and nobody ever gets to see your face, but it is, uh, I know that where we're hopefully gonna head tonight with some of our conversation, you're gonna put a lot of smiles on a lot of faces because that was right in the heyday of, of Norfolk just getting started all the way through some really good times. But before we get there, Gil, tell folks a little bit about more of yourself and your, your history in radio before we get started with the Norfolk stuff. All righty. Of course, there was uh, radio before I moved to the Dothan area. I lived mainly, well, my first radio job was in North Dakota. After one winter, I said, nope, no more of that. I went back to Santa Barbara area. I worked in the Santa Barbara Lompoc area till uh, 1978. My wife, at the time when she graduated from college, she was working with a uh, young couple. She was working with this lady from Mobile. And they kept telling us how cool the South was, how nice it was down here. So they invited us down. So we came to visit them and we, we loved it. We liked Mobile. We liked the whole area. We went back to California. Okay, we're going to move to Alabama. And I put an ad in the trade magazine and Clark Jones, who had just bought WAGF in Dothan, hired me. He hired a whole new staff from around the country. He hired a, a Chuck Jackson from Illinois. And I can't remember. He hired someone from Kentucky. So he had a whole new staff come in. So we just packed everything up. I think my oldest son was five years old at the time. And I had a second son who was like six months old. And we went cross country to Alabama. And wow. you know, I've just stayed, you know, other than the two years I moved to Birmingham, I've always been in the Wiregrass because I love it. It was a great place to, great place. I love the, uh, the recreation programs that the area has and just a great place to raise a family. Gosh, that was such a leap of faith with two young children yeah. driving or coming all the way across country. And I've been to Santa Barbara and it's a beautiful part of California, but that really must have, you must have seen <laughs> really like. Cultural shock, culture shock. <laughs> yeah. But you, you've been active in radio, whether it's uh, as an announcer or a DJ or some, some affiliation with radio really since the seventies. And I know you've seen the evolution and changes, not just with the radio side, with music, with news, et cetera, but also the way that sports are delivered through the radio. And I know at different times, both Dothan and Northview had contracts with different radio stations, but you didn't initially start with Northview. I know that you were calling Dothan High. In fact, you were part of a state championship team with Coach Bubba Johnson. So tell us, tell us about that a little bit. Well, let me tell you, I, I got here, I think my first day at the radio station was on April Fool's Day, April 1st uh, in 1978. And right away, we swung into, we were a small station, so we swung into sports. We did uh, Dothan High Baseball. We did Dixie Major Baseball. We did, uh, we did Wallace Community College Baseball. And I think that year they all won state championships. But with Bubba, I started doing uh, Dothan High Baseball. And they went into the playoffs, and I'll never forget. You you really are jogging my memory because I thought about this. I was going down to Satsuma. I think we were playing Satsuma in the playoffs, the best two out of three, I think it was. And 
Uh, my wife went with me at the time, my, like I say, my two sons, one was six months old, one five years old, and the car overheated, I think around the Funiac Springs, okay? <laughs> and what happened was, I am not a mechanic at all, so I didn't know, but it was the thermostat got stuck is what it was. Mm -hmm. But we're stranded there at a Hardee's, and that was pre-cell phone days, so you're sort of stuck. Yeah. And fortunately, Bubba and the team stopped at that Hardee's. So <laughs> I, can, I proceeded to load my equipment on, go with the team to the ball game, and my wife and two boys stayed there until the owner came from Dothan to pick them up and take them back. Wow. Because the show must go on. So wow. that, that was my inauguration into, uh, into doing Dothan High playoffs, and we won the state that year. And it just gets better, Bernard. It gets better. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Let me tell you, we, then we took the uh, we took the baseball team after they won the championship. We took them to an Atlanta Braves game. We rented a bus. The station rented a bus. We took the whole team. Well, at that time, Ron Ingram, who we've talked about, was with the Dothan Progress. He helped me so much in in getting to know people, getting to know the sports atmosphere in the whole Wiregrass area. He was he went with us, and Ron and I. After we got there early, so Ron and I are going to go across the street to the hotel lounge and have a beer, have a drink, you know, and we walk in there, but three quarters of the Dothan High baseball team's in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was after they graduated. So at that time, and the statute of limitations has run out, by the way, because I heard you say that already. <laughs> but I think dr the drinking age for beer in Georgia at that time was 18. So some of them, they were legal, but it, we walked in there, we knew everybody in the bar. Oh, <laughs> and they had these little circular 18-inch tables, uh -huh. and there was probably three, three players at about six or seven tables mm -hmm. with no room for anything except bottles because oh, half awesome. the hour was ending, so they had to order as many as they could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so after that, we went to the game, we did that, then we're leaving and about 10 miles down the road on the bus, one of the players says, hey, Coach Johnson, so-and-so is missing. So-and-so is missing. Oh, wow. <laughs> a couple of players were not on the bus. So we're like 10, 15 miles down the road. We turn around, go back. The lights are all out at the stadium. I mean, just a few in the parking lot. But we see these two shadows huffing it when they saw our bus. <laughs> I don't know who it was. I can't remember who it was. But they were never so happy to see a bus and Coach Bubba Johnson. <laughs> well, if Bubba pops on tonight, I'll catch it. We're going to ask him if he happens to come on tonight live. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Ron Ingram, I've had the pleasure of knowing Ron for many years. I've interviewed him on a different show. I don't know of an individual who can spout more statistics, more players' names, and more specific events related to sports. He is the encyclopedia when it comes to he, Alabama sports. He really is. And also to the Wiregrass, you know, Bernard, he started the Dothan Progress tip-off class, the Christmas tournament mm -hmm. at the uh, Dothan Civic Center when he was with the Dothan Progress. He did so much, so much for Wiregrass sports. And I know he's in the, I think he's in the Hall of Fame, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah. Because, yeah. And, I know he's in the Wiregrass Hall of Fame, but you're right. He is a walking encyclopedia, like we were talking. He can tell you, Bernard, when you fumbled the ball, when it was third and goal from the so-and-so yard line with 732 left in the ball game, he knows all that. Once the game is done, I forget it. I, I don't have to. I don't have to. Remember. He has to remember to write it down and everything else. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that later in the fall or early winter, if his schedule permits, I'll get him on the program just listen to him. I won't have to say much. He can just start talking no, about no. Cougars, Cougars football. But let's let's take it to that first uh, 78, the year you were calling Dothan High football. And that's also the first year that, of Northview football. And the two teams played in the first uh, Circle City Classic or whatever you want to call the game. And so lead us through. I know it was a tough season for Dothan High that year. But lead us through a little bit of that season and into that game. What was that like for the two teams to play? Well, you know, I was thinking about that when I was uh, thinking about coming on your program. You know, that was the day that I, I think I remember back in 1978, you had to have your, you had people who had their chairs, their stadium seats in the stadium by 430 in the afternoon. They were ready for that game. 
they were ready for that. And that was on both sides. Those days are no longer, and that's sad because it was just such a cool environment. It really was. And Dothan, I, I can't remember if that was, uh, that was down the line when we played Northview. Dothan played Northview like in the third or fourth game of the year, I believe, yeah. somewhere in there. It was early. It was not, it had not been pushed to the end of the season yet. Right. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, that was a close game. I think, I think it wasn't until the third meeting until mm -hmm. the Dothan High won, because I think Northview won the first two meetings, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But they were not high scoring games. I think it wasn't the first game like 10 to 7. Something and, like that. If anybody's watching knows the score, I can look it up. But, but those were those early games were all defensive oriented games. They were. And I, I remember uh, another thing I remember now, you know, jogging my memory, Marcus Hill played for the Dothan Eye Tigers. Marcus spent more time in other people's backfield than most running backs did. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was and plus he he was a linebacker. He played from from line to line. I mean, he was, he was everywhere. And he was really uh, probably the only really bright spot because the Tigers were one and nine. And like I said, it was tough. It's easy to broadcast a, a team that's nine and two or 13 and one, you win the state, that's easy. But when you're dealing with a one and nine, I've always tried to stay positive and give those kids, you know, the uh, benefit of the doubt in this type of thing. And it, and it really is hard on them because I, I was looking at the scores today and I think there was one game we got whipped like 48 to nothing. I think one of the last games of the year or whatever, but, but it was, it was really hard. And like I say, I think Dothan and Northview, that was a great uh, rivalry. And I think Northview and enterprise, Dothan and enterprise, that was another one. You had to be there early to get a good seat because it was almost all, it was 10,000 people in that stadium. It was electricity. You could feel it. Gil, back at that time period in the late seventies and even into the early eighties, how much interaction did you have in your position calling the games up in the box with the coaches or any of the staff or the players themselves from Dothan High? Because I know that's that was your responsibilities early on. And not so much with the players, but we did we did a lot with the coaches. The coaches, I can't say enough about them. Coach Harry Wayne Parrish, I used to go over there. I remember going over to Northview, and uh, Coach Parrish is uh, is cutting the grass out there in a tractor, and we're, we were we were commiserating for a while there. Both of us, I think, are the same age, and I think we were both turning 40 at one time, and we're going, oh, my gosh, our life is done. What have we, <laughs> what have we accomplished? But and, and Coach Philip Creel, uh, Coach uh, Jim Golden was over, still already over there. They were just, the coaches were great because, first of all, they were so they couldn't believe that we were carrying them, that we cared enough. I because I used to do a coaches show from Ray's Restaurant on Saturday mornings, and the coaches all hung out there. So I would grab whoever was there, and they were so so satisfying, and they were so happy to you know talk about their program, regardless if it was one and nine. But yeah, mm -hmm. both both Coach Parrish and his staff, and I remember, I'm just trying to think now, I'm, names are popping in my head, Jim Hawkins, I know was over at uh, Dothan High, so these guys, they really helped, and like I say, the football players, personally, not so much, because like you say, you wore jerseys, and if you didn't have your jersey on, I right. didn't know. Right. Well, it's, it was a little easier, you saw them up close and personal, you know, but it, it was great. Did they, did you have to create your own um, talking points, so to speak, or did they give you some insight to, for example, some of the plays to maybe look out for, or some of the other team's most notable players, those kind of things, or were you really kind of doing that all your, yourself? Well, no, I had a color person, and I had a color guy, mm -hmm. and for the, in the latter years, it was Mike Hutto, Mike really helped me because he was, he had been a coach, and he knew what to look for. I, I had the easy part, play by play is easy, Color is the hard part. You tell why it happened. I'm telling you what happened. Yeah. They're telling you why it happened. Yeah. And so uh, Mike Hutto, being a former line coach, he knew what to look for. He knew the tendencies. If we were calling a Dothan Northview game, he knew the tendencies of Northview. He knew the tendencies of Dothan on defense or enterprise because he had dealt with them. So they really had the hard job and they really did that. And I, all I did was, you know, hey, tell you what's going on. You know, that, that to me was always the easy part. I did color one time, Bernard, mm -hmm. one time I was in Carroll High and Jeff White, a guy that used to do color for me and had cancer and he had just come back from uh, 
Houston for treatment. And it was going to be his last game. He didn't have long. So I thought, okay, I'm going to let him do the play-by-play because he loved football. I let him do the play-by-play. I did the color. That was the longest night. <laughs> I, I felt like I was repeating myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about the logistics of the press box. Uh, no. <laughs> the, the actual press box at Rip Hughes. How close were the fans to where you were seated? Could they well, actually they were- hear you? Could they actually hear you, not on just the radio, but could they hear you audibly into the stadium where they were seated? Well, they could hear, because you look, see them look up every once in a while. Yeah. Luckily, we had windows that closed, but mm-hmm. we would put a mic outside the window so we would pick up the crowd effect, because mm-hmm. I don't like it when guys sound like they're in a hollow booth. So we right, would put a right. mic up front. But every once in a while, that mic tended to pick up somebody who was down below and they're really criticizing what's going on or they're not too happy or they're listening. And then all of a sudden I say something and their head pops up and they're looking up at me. And the <laughs> logistics of it was that, you know, it was, it was good, but let me tell I got to tell you one year we carried, when I was at Wolf, we carried Houston Academy and they were playing Coffee Springs. Have you ever been to Coffee Springs? I mean, back then. Okay. First of all, we got in the booth and you had to climb up this ladder and I had a, a Marty, it was a transistor, it was a uh, portable transmitter. It was weighed about 20 pounds, hard to carry up. We got it up there. Well, Houston Academy scored. And after they scored, they started walking to the other end of the field. I thought, the quarter's not over yet, what's going on? Well, at the end they scored that they were going to was a pig farmer. And they, he wouldn't allow him to kick the extra point into his pig farm. So we walked to the other end to kick the extra point. That's a cemetery. <laughs> oh, that's, you know, that's the beauty of small town football or yeah. small town sports, because that's only in a small community like that, that you, oh, I just, I love those kind of stories. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. I want to know, how did you, how did you call something like that when your people are listening on the radio and you're having to say, well, we're still in the middle of the quarter, but the teams are walking to the other end. Yeah. Well, I think someone hollered in the press box. They're kicking it at that end. You know, they, then they told me about it during a timeout. You know, we'll be back right after this. And they say, well, the pig farmer does not allow to kick the extra point. So you have to go to the other end to kick it and then resume play switch fields again. And then yeah. who, gets the, who gets the luxury of, or the, the, the chore of going into the cemetery at night to go retrieve the kid? Gotcha. You know, it's win-win. That's right. That's awesome. Well, Gil, let's, let's bring it to Northview football for a little bit. When, when did you call Northview games? I know you had Dothan games in the late 70s. When did you start doing some Northview games? I did. I started doing them somewhere in the 80s, but I did the 1981 championship game up at Legion Field. Let's start right there. Yeah, yeah, that was good. I think that was very the very first one because I was working at WAGF and Wolf was carrying, I think Wolf at that time was carrying uh, Northview football, but we both carried the championship game. And, I, you know, it, it was great. I walked down, that's the first time I'd been on, you know, the artificial turf and this type of thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is hard, but it was a, it was a fantastic game, but that was the first game. Were you living in Birmingham at the time? Or were you no, still no, I was still here. I was still here. I didn't live in, I lived in Birmingham about 84, 85, because when you guys won it in 85, I remember going with Ron, a- Ron Ingram was already working for the Birmingham paper and him and I went to the base, uh, to the, uh, to the game, to the championship game. Now, how was it in Legion Field calling the 81 game compared to being at Rip Hughes, which is, a much smaller stadium, yeah. <laughs> much closer to the action. Did you have to bring out binoculars? Did you have to do anything differently from up there? No, Legion not Field? really, because it, one thing it was, you know, it was played during the day. So mm-hmm. you didn't have a problem of seeing numbers or the lights glaring off of anything, but there really wasn't that much difference other than the distance itself. And like I say, I had a good color person at the time and they picked up, they would pick the tackles up and, and you know, the, uh, it, it's so funny, big time college football and that they have the luxury of someone constantly whispering in their ears, telling you who made the tackle. It was just us two. And then either Ron Ingram or Elaine Bracken, who used to be oh, with the progress. Oh, Elaine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah. They used to supply me with the halftime stats. But more or less, I learned in mm-hmm. all sports, I kept the book by myself. I kept 
I, I even yardage, you know, I would make a little chart. I had a, sort of a chart that I made out of the numbers, you know, like number 17 carrying for 33, blah, blah, you know, and I kept it myself, but we didn't have much help, but it, it was fun. It was fun. It was a magic moment, you know, and, and Bernard and I got wound up just like the coaches did, whether you won or lost. I mean, if, if Doth and I are Northview, the team I was covering, if we won, I was, I was pumped up all the way home. If we lost, I lost with you guys. Well, I was going to ask you after that 81 thrilling victory, did you travel to the hotel? I mean, to the restaurant, did you travel with back with the team at all? Or were you not part of that celebration at that time? No, did, we, have, did you go and interview coaches and players after the game? No, I want to say we had. I want to say we had Coach Harry Wayne Parrish after the game down on the field. But after that, no, we just drove right back because uh, we drove. It was a one day trip for us, you know. Wow. Up and, yeah, a lot of those kind of trips. One in the morning, two in the morning. You're getting back from Mobile or wherever it might be. Wow, crazy, crazy. But that was you do you it know, because. You, you do it because you love it, you know. I was just getting ready to say, you, you, you had to have loved what you were doing or you, you certainly wouldn't be putting in those kind of hours. No, and let me tell you, it wasn't even minimum wage what you got paid to do the ball game. But, I, and I think I told you when we were initially talking, the reason it really, the reason I did it for me, you know, I didn't do it for the monetary end of it. I did it because a lot of people, that, first of all, couldn't get off to go to, say, a Birmingham game or a game in Mobile or wherever at two in the afternoon when you I mean, they couldn't afford to get off. They couldn't afford to go to the game. Your grandparents love to hear that name on the radio. You call their grandson. You call their kids. And basically, it was a community thing. That's really why I did. That's I got more satisfaction out of that that way. That's even though I grew up in the era where we started to have cable TV. We had three channels, and then it evolved to cable. I still, even to this day love listening to sports on radio particularly baseball yep and it just it just what i grew yeah. up it's just something i enjoy particularly when you have announcers who are vested in it who understand it and and know you know the program not just calling yet another game kind yeah. of yeah well take us into the the 80s or whenever it is you began with northview football after the 81 season let me look can i tell you one more story yeah. that only happens in the no, south all <laughs> only, <laughs> only happens in alabama mm -hmm. it was either the 78 or 79 we were playing in enterprise mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it's the early part of the game and all of a sudden here comes a cop car with the blue light special and everything flying up to whatever what base memorial stadium is that what it was in that here in enterprise is where i live now flying up there and right behind the team and all that kim kennedy who was the kicker forgot his kicking shoe in dothan so it was delivered by the policeman with the blue lights on <laughs> oh no. that's awesome so he got his kicking shoe, but he forgot his kicking shoe. To, where else would you yeah. have it delivered by a police car with the blue lights on, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, oh, that's, those are some yeah. great, great memories. Um, Gil, tell us, what was it like communicating and dealing with Coach Parrish, Coach Andrews, Hicks, any of those coaches from Northview when you were, were starting to do the games? Oh, those guys, they, they were fantastic. And you've had several on them. Yeah, you know. Now, wait, wait, I have to pause you. That's, they're a rough crowd. They don't take any gruff. They, I don't know how you were able to, and two of them are on, by the way, watching. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Fix and Andrew is on to welcome them to the show. There's a whole bunch of folks here, Gil, but go ahead. Tell us about yeah. that. I tell you what, all those coaches, Coach Andrews, Coach Harry Wayne Parrish, like I say, they appreciated, you know, it being out there for the community and sharing it with the community. And they really did. They helped me in every way. And uh, who are we talking about? I, I just missed one of the coaches. Coach uh, Hicks. Pardon? Randy Hicks was the other name of me. Yeah, Ra Randy Hicks was another one, you know. So all these, all these guys, they were so helpful in everything they did. And what I appreciate, oh, Randy Ragsdale was another one you had on that I remember Randy. And he was, he was sort of a laid back as far as I was concerned in comparison to what you had over there. <laughs> but you know what I like, you know what I like, Bernard, and the coaches don't get enough credit. And I heard uh, 
a couple of the players that you had on talking about what an influence a lot of these coaches have had on their lives going down the line that people aren't aware of. All they do, they don't realize how much time a coach spends with a young man when he plays football or basketball, baseball with them for three or four years. They spend a lot of time. They get to know the wants and the needs of a lot of these young kids, and they get the counseling. I think, was it Janaski said that he really followed the kids that he had that coached or that uh, graduated from college and yeah. 16 of the 18 that graduated from yeah. college or came from single parent families. I yeah, mean, for a coach, yeah, for a coach, he's not doing it for the money. He's doing it for the love of the people, you know, mm -hmm. and those guys, they, they were great. They always were. If I wanted to interview coach Parrish, he would make himself because at one time I did a show for a uh, Comcast mm -hmm. and we used to go around say on Wednesday, and I can't remember what, what day of the week, but we'd go and do a segment like 15 minutes with the Northview coach, 15 minutes with Houston Academy, 15 minutes with Dothan, and we'd tape it and put it on Comcast. And I do the interview and they were always, they were always so helpful, no matter what, you know, I mean, really, I can't say enough about them. Well, coach Andrews just put a kind note in there and he said that you were very professional and awesome, had an awesome voice. <laughs> yeah, I have to watch. I have to watch where, you know, people, like you say, I have the perfect face for radio. So, and I have been in stores where I'll say something and you can see a head whip around like, wait a minute, that voice. I know, I know that, that voice. voice. I, know yeah. that voice. <laughs> so I have to be careful. Gil, you, you had a front row seat to really some memorable games, including that 90. Uh, Viger playoff game. Oh, <laughs> and I've had several uh, members of the team who were played in that game or coached in that game have come on. And I want to hear your perspective. I want to oh, hear what you remember. First of all, let me tell you how it. Go ahead. I got so excited because I don't, we, at that time, Viger was really ranked pretty high, if I'm not mistaken. They were, they were always ranked high. Yeah. And they had this press box, Bernard. First of all, you walked into it. Then you stepped up and about, it had an, about an 18 inch step and it had a little platform up there where you could put your book in your chair. And if you moved your chair at all, you fell off the edge. Ooh. Okay, you could not, you could not get excited. Well, right. I got excited at the end of the game. I fell off the, <laughs> I fell backwards. <laughs> I mean, that, that was a memorable game because no one gave us a chance, I don't think, in that game to win that thing. But that was, that was just a, a great game. I, I, I couldn't believe it, you know. Well, for those of you who don't know, that 1990 call game call by Gil, and who was your partner that day? Do you remember? I'm what year was it? 1990. Okay, that would have been Mike Cutto. Mike Cutto took care of me. <laughs> was, that, was that the game that you guys won the award for the game? Call? That was... Yes, we, Associated Press was really big back in this, right before the 2010 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we submitted, I submitted the play-by-play -play for that game for, to the Associated Press to be considered for an award. And it won the, uh, we were awarded the best play, by, I, I don't know if it's high school, I'd have to read, I haven't looked at it in a long time, but best play-by-play -play in the state of Alabama. And that was, that was the game that won it for me too. <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Gil, what years, if you recall, were you part of the Northview broadcast into the 80s and 90s? But do you remember the years? Well, I, I think through the uh, right before I moved to Birmingham, I know in the early 80s, 82, 83, 84 in there, because I was working at Wolf at the time. And I and then after I came back, various stations would ask me to do games for them. And I know as even as current as uh, about three or four years ago. I did some Northview games through the year. Like I say, I got a chance, you know, I saw all you guys play and it's always rewarding. And a lot of times I fo I'll, I'll follow guys that have uh, graduated from around here and have gone on to college. All of a sudden I'll remember, hey, let's see what so-and-so is doing, you know? And it's always rewarding to see these guys because you, you knew there was something special even when you guys were in high school. There's something special about somebody. You, you certainly listed off some very notable ones, Gabe Gross being one. Marcus Hill, I'm sure you have countless memories of some of these more notable players who went on not to just play on Friday nights and then on Saturdays, but also on Sundays. Yeah, Larry Roberts is one of the first big, I mean, 
that guy, I've seen him tackle to, to get to the ball, grab the running back and the quarterback at the same time. He, I remember at Legion Field before the state championship game, he was practicing, he was warming up, kicking off. Well, he's kicking it through the other uprights, field goal. <laughs> I mean, the, the guy was a tremendous talent and yeah. basketball too. And yeah. I would, I did the PA at the basketball classics in at the uh, Civic Center. And, you know, it was Larry played basketball also. And I would say, the foul, 52, whatever his number was, Larry Roberts. And between games, he said, sir, could you not call my name so loud? <laughs> he, he, he was a huge presence regardless of where he was, but one of the nicest men. Yes. The nicest guys, gone, gone way too soon. But, you know, when he played in that 81 game, uh, you know, the next year he was starring on that same field for Alabama for the yeah. three or four years after that, because with Alabama playing a lot of their games, the bigger games at Legion Field back in that time, and not necessarily on campus at Bryant Denny Stadium. Yeah, he, he, he was fantastic. Like I say, it's always something, and also from an officiating point, because I told you I did officiate basketball and this, and, and you could spot these guys. Gabe Gross was always very interesting because I remember when he played basketball at the uh, boys club, Gabe wasn't a natural gifted athlete. He worked at it for everything he got. That is one thing. And you could see even at that age, he wasn't the best a gifted, most gifted player out there, but he's gonna beat you. I remember when Dothan and Northview played and the one game, and I think his senior year, and it was coming down right to the end. I, I don't know what the score was, but Northview had to score to win. And I told Mike, I said, Gabe's going to beat us. Gabe's going to beat us. And sure as heck, he scored the winning touchdown. I mean, he would find a way to get it done. And, and you saw that in so many of these high school players. You could pick out the special people. You could well, really I was say with, with Gabe coming from such an athletic uh, family, his brother, yeah. Bo, his father, Lee, and just the, there's just something in their DNA. And it's not, you, 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 you're so right. It's, you can pretty quickly figure out who the more gifted and talented athletes on the field, but it's not all just in their genes, so to speak. They're also the hardest workers. They're also right. the leaders on the team. And I think that's what makes the Gabe Grosses of the world stand out. That's what makes the Larry Roberts. They are gifted, but no yeah. one out hustles or outworks them in the that's right. either. Bernard, I don't know if you remember a Dolphin player, Keith Stokes. I remember the name. I don't don't remember. Okay, uh, Coach Sherry Collins and I used to talk about him. To mm -hmm. me, in my opinion, he was the not the most talented player at Dothan I, but he was the best all around. But he never came off the field. Mm -hmm. He kicked off. He kicked extra points. He punted. He was a running back, <laughs> and he played defense. Wow. And wow. he spent years in the. He, I think he spent a couple of years in the NFL. But he spent years up in the Canadian Football League. And I looked him up just the other day out of curiosity. Now he's an assistant coach for one of the Canadian. But there was a, there was, there was a young man that he was partly gifted, but he worked at everything, everything. And that's why he's where he's at today. Yeah, that's, that's it's what, one of the things that, that makes me shake my head is when you see these gifted, talented athletes who don't last. It's because yeah. they've been the hard work. They just rely on what they've done in the past and just assume that their skills will always be there. And that's not the ones who make no. the difference. Those are the ones no. who flame out the most, most quickly. Well, Gil, and I, guys, I, I meant to reset a few minutes ago. I'm talking with a longtime radio man, Gil <laughs> Anthony. Gil has called uh, Northview and Dothan games baseball uh, he's refereed for many sports. He's been uh, more recently part, and we're going to get to this part in just a minute, Gil. He's also involved in the blues and has a very highly recognized uh, station, or excuse me, show that we're going to get to in just a minute. But Gil, is that, has sports always been part of your, your livelihood or is that something yeah. that came, up, came upon you when no. you came to Alabama? No, no, I have always loved sports. In fact, I grew up, I was born in Dickinson, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And I used to listen to this guy named Bob Weiler was his name. And he used to do basketball play-by-play. -play. And he was so good and he spoke so quickly. And I always tried to 
I tried to do what he did. And I would read the sports pages out loud, the box scores, whatever it was. I love sports. And I remember, I think when I was a junior or senior in high school, our local radio station had a uh, high school program where it was high school news notes type thing. And I was chosen once to read all the little events going on, homecoming and all that. And the speech teacher thought I did fantastic, you know, at this type of thing. And she evidently knew I still had the perfect face for radio. So, and after, uh, after I got out of the service and was going to school, you know, I listened to Chick Hearn. When I went, to, I went to college in Santa Barbara and I used to go to their basketball practices and just watch them and practice doing play-by-play -play during their scrimmages. So I've always, I say, I've never worked a day in my life because I'm doing what I love. And when you do something you love, it's not a job. Music and sports have always been part of my life. They're in my heart. You know, it's so awesome that you say that. A job is something you have to do. Like That's right. Chore, like a chore or an errand. Yeah. To me, something that you love to do, that's your, your profession. And maybe we're just talking semantics of words, but I think there's a huge difference there. And when you're calling a game, when you're doing play by play for a sport that you enjoy in a community that you love, it comes out in it. It comes out in your yeah. product. And I'm sure that your the listeners over the decades, uh, particularly with high school sports, have appreciated that. Because like you said, if you're in a store and they hear your voice and they whip around and they say, <laughs> I know that voice, that just speaks to your product and your passion. Yeah. By awesome. the way, Bernard, I don't know if you know, do you know that Scenic Cable has old uh, Northview football and baseball or basketball games on their cable? No. Can, they have the Scenic Cable Network. Okay. And Write that down. Yeah. I do. I was talking to Mitt Kirkland just before we went on because I wanted to know the name, but I think it's Scenic Cable Network. And you can go to, I think it's on YouTube. You can watch their, watch old Northview football games at old, from oh. 2001 on up, I believe is what they have. Awesome. awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. That's yeah, great. it is. Well, because, you know, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say ahead. the last couple of minutes before we get out of here, I want to really touch on two topics. Uh, the last topic I want to talk about is about the blues and what you're doing these days, because I want people to know if, if in case they don't know about what you're actively doing. But before we get that, and this is kind of a broad or open ended and it doesn't matter to me the sport. It doesn't matter to me the school, because I know you called games for Carroll and other schools uh, over the years. There's got to be some notable players, coaches or games or things that really stick out in your mind. And you've, you've mentioned so many players and a couple of off the field, awesome things like Kim Kennedy's shoe. That's, that's an awesome story. But is there anything else that really just sticks out that you had the first front row seat, so to speak, to witness back in the day? Well, I, I think probably, you know, and my connection really with basketball would be Dothan High and uh, James Critton for Dothan High before the three-point shot came across. I mean, that kid was fantastic. Otis Dreary from Dothan High. Kevin Jackson from Northview Football. I don't know if anybody ever hit harder than Kevin did. Did they? No. no. I mean, you could hear it. You could hear it. Those, some of those guys just, you know, and like I say, looking through the articles that you have put up, some of those names that come up there. I remember Alan Lopez was one heck of a field goal kicker. I mean, all these guys, they bring back some, just some vivid memory of what they excelled in. You know, that was great coaches. I would have to say one of the coaches that I really, really loved and loved the way he coached was coach Wade Morrison, the basketball coach at Dothan high. Uh, you know, he had a lot of, he coached Artis Gilmore back in the day when he was in middle school, but I like the way he coached and he does what a lot of coaches do, but I guess because the numbers were smaller and being right there in basketball, he treated everybody differently because everybody needed to be treated differently. He could get more out of you by stroking you. He could get more out of this guy by kicking him in the butt, more say, but he knew exactly which, which switch to, uh, 
to turn on and turn off. And he knew that everybody was not treated the same. And that's what, that's how he got the most. And I think a lot of these coach, coach Harry Wayne Parrish was the same way. Coach Jim Golden, coach Bobby Devane, all these guys know coach Randy Ragsdale was a perfect example. These guys know what switches to flip on and off to get the most production out. And you're, they're individuals. Young guys are individuals. They're not one solid, you know, everybody has a different mold. You know, it's it's so it's so true. The the personalities. It's it's so different when you've got fourteen to eighteen year olds in high school, as opposed to eighteen to twenty two year olds in college, and then beyond that in the pros, you can't treat everybody the same because not everybody responds. No. Uh, sometimes you may put them back into a shell, or they may become uh, defiant. But that's what I think really uh, you you hit on that it helps. Uh, the coaches to separate themselves from all the other coaches. That's what the great ones recognize. Yeah. And, and they do, they spend a lot more time than people realize caring about the individuals. They really, and you know, this from experience at every level, Bernard, that, that coaches, uh, you know, go out of their way, especially at the, at the formative level at the junior high and at the high school level right there where coaches Every coach is can one on one with you. You you dealt with every Northview coach, I'm sure. Whereas opposed to say when you went on to college, you didn't deal with every coach. You dealt with the specialty coach, and that was it. But uh, you know, it's a more one on one in the uh, junior high and high school. Well, Gil, take us to the present time. Tell us about your program and the Blues and what you're doing that has just resonated with so many Blues fans. Well, actually, I started doing a blues program when I was working for a station in Eufaula, up in Eufaula, WDMT, back in the early 90s, right around 92, 93, I started doing a two-hour program. And I also then started sending it out to radio stations on cassette, I, about six or seven radio stations, and I, I can't even remember where they were. They were in Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida. I would send them two hours on cassette every, every week, and it progressed where... I came back to Dothan. I was working up in Eufaula. Then I came back to work in Dothan. I worked in the barbecue business for a while. I had a barbecue restaurant in 95, 96, right in there. And then I started doing a, a blue show on my off time. And then 97, I started doing a five hour show at a station in Daleville. And I did that at various stations. I did five hours. I've been on Monday nights for 20 plus years because Monday nights and like you choose this night, Monday night for me was where I had the least obstruction of getting preempted by games. People were at home on Monday because you've been on the go all weekend. So I always kept it and I had it from five to 11. And believe it or not, since 19, since I went on the air in 1990, somewhere say 95, I have missed two shows. One was because of open heart surgery. <laughs> yeah, you know, what can I say? <laughs> and the other, my son was, he went to Huntington and he played basketball there and it was senior parents night. So, and that was a Monday night. So I went there, I wouldn't miss that. So those were the only two times that I've missed a program. Now I'm fortunate I do two five hour programs, one out of enterprise at a station Weevil 101 where the old KMX was right at the corner of the Bow Weevil and then one out of DIG, the uh, AM in Dothan. And it's Sunday, one's uh, Enterprise is Sunday, Monday is Dothan, each five hours. And it's, I've been doing it for so long. I go to Memphis a couple times a year. I've gotten to know, that's my blues family. I've gotten to know, and I've been blessed to know a lot of the artists, a lot of the blues family. And we just have a heck of a time. And then about three or four years ago, our server was down at my Monday station. And I, I usually type, just like you say, tonight I'm gonna to be featuring so-and-so. And I said, I'm sorry, but we're not streaming. The server is down. So this friend of mine calls me and says, hey, why don't you take your phone, go to Facebook and go to Facebook Live, put it by your monitor and people can still see and hear you. And I got, I started doing, I did that. And I thought, wow, this is cool. So I do it just for the first two hours where I sort of silo cast Facebook and Facebook and uh, the uh, radio show. So it's like doing two different programs because I'm here talking to you on Facebook. Yeah. And then when the rest song is over, I have to be straight on the air. Right. right. And especially during this COVID situation where a lot of the artists are at home, they're not working. So they get a chance to interact with one another. So it, it, it's really turned out and I love it. It's my passion now. 
Very you know. cool. Well, Gil, how can people reach out to you or follow what you're doing on Facebook or on live with the radio? Okay, you they can just go to, uh, send me a friend request, mm -hmm. at, you know, Gil Anthony Blues or Gil, just go to the Facebook, Gil Anthony, or they go to Blues Power. And because that, you know, they'll get, they can get me there. And, you know, we just have, we have a heck of a time. We have, we have like Flamingo No Pants Monday where <laughs> you don't, you're not allowed to wear pants while you watch my show and everybody stands up at 7.30. Some people actually think I can see them. <laughs> right. Oh, that's awesome. The flamingo star, I don't know where that started, but I have gotten flamingo stuff from all over the world. I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's fun. It's my passion. You know, people say, where are you going to retire? I said, from what? Right, uh, right. I, I love the people. I, I love my blues family. I love each and every one of them. They put up with me, you know, so it, it, I, I put this, uh, I promoted this program on my Facebook page and it was conversation with cougars. Mm -hmm. And of course, one lady, one lady listener over in Georgia said, I read halfway through the, uh, through the promo before I realized what kind of cougars you were talking about. <laughs> talking about women like me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Gosh, Gil, I have so enjoyed our conversation tonight. I really appreciate you taking us through your story and just uh, amazing fun stories tonight. Oh, hey, anytime. And I, and I appreciate, I really do. I, I mean it. And I, I think I speak for a lot of people that you probably, you probably don't see being up in Birmingham. And I, I, in fact, I've mentioned it to a couple of people and they're jotting it down. They want to watch some of them. And I know I've run into people that have watched some of your programs, but I appreciate what you do because, and who would have thought, I don't know. How did you come up with the idea? Let me ask you the question. How'd you come up with this idea? The, the, the long and the short version is that after the two schools merged and Northview was no longer, there was no outlet for us to continue to get together or to rally around. So I would love to tell you, I planned this because of the pandemic, but it was just happen chance. Uh, I created the website, the, the Facebook page in December. I called Coach Parrish and I said, I wanna interview you on here because I have other Facebook interview shows that are unrelated right. to Northview. And I've so it just, it just evolved from that. And Coach Parrish yeah. was the first interview and it was so well received. And it's just, the ball has just kept rolling since then. Well, you realize you probably won't hear from me again because I am really under the witness protection program. And I really don't even know where I'm at. And if I find out where I'm at, I'm gonna have to move. So. <laughs> Well, thank no, but you. I appreciate what you do, and I want to watch a lot, a lot of these programs uh, because, like I say, they bring up names I hadn't thought about in 20, 25 years, but they're good memories, all of them. They really are. Well, I, don't see any, I don't think of anything negative when I hear some of those names come up. I really don't. Spanky well, Thomas, you brought up Spanky. I got to say, it's Spanky Thomas, you know, that, that kid. What a joy to be around all the time. Someone brought his name up in one of your programs. Sure did. He'll never be forgotten. Yeah. That was uh, a remarkable uh, young man. Uh, remarkable young man. Well, anyway, these, okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> no, it's okay. All of these interviews, after we finish them live, I keep them on my personal face uh, YouTube channel. So anybody can access them there. But I want to thank you again. I want to thank everybody who's been watching us live. Uh, Gil, afterward, there's some comments in there you may want to go see and, and comment on. <laughs> but guys, as we do every Wednesday at uh, 7 o'clock Central, Conversations with Cougars. I hope you guys have a safe rest of your week, and we'll catch you next week. Take care.